All right, sounds good. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the webinar series, Tehuar Matters. My name is Alessandra Esteves, and I will share the presentation in a second. So again, this is a webinar format, so I don't see you and uh, I cannot hear you, but you can text me on the chat box and I'll be reading the messages too. Okay, if you have any questions, please you know, interrupt, raise your hand, put on the Q&A, put on the chat. I'll, I'll make sure I'll take a look at everything. Um, so the order for the tasting tonight is um, Chateau Franc Couple Bordeaux Superior first, and then the Altamira Tres Fincas um, second, okay? And we will taste this wines at the end of the presentation. All right, so I will um, begin by sharing my screen. And uh, hopefully you can all see the screen and, um, and it looks good. Yeah, can you please confirm screen? Everything looks good. All right. Um, okay, so we'll get ready. Um, so I believe most of you have um, seen me before, um, but my name is Alessandra Steves. I'm director of wine education for the Florida Wine Academy. I'm also a master of wine candidate, and you will see a lot of um, this webinar series um, I'm actually doing because it helps me study as well. So today we are going to go deep into blending, and I'm so excited, uh, and this is very geeky stuff, I have to warn and I have to advise you, um, but it is, you know, just incredible knowledge. Um, so I have the diploma, the WCT level four, and champagne, master level, French wine scholar, um, certified specialist of wine, um, and very excited to be here with you, okay? And also, you know us, so Florida Wine Academy, where we teach courses, classes, certifications, 305 wines. We have a great selection of wines. And then Miami Champagne Week uh, and Vino Summit, which is a conference, okay? So the, keep in mind and you know, just keep um, a look on the emails because we'll be sharing some um, new classes and, and new information very soon. All right, so um, let's get started. So session two is Bordeaux Blends. So we are going to take a look into new world versus old world. So what does that mean? Does terroir matter in this case? So we are going to look um, at it. So I'll begin the session by recapping a little bit. Um, last, oh, two weeks ago, session, so session one, uh, because I know some of you joined later or, you know, just watched the video. So I'll do a quick recap just for, for us to understand a couple of terms. And then we are going to talk about the art of blending. And um, it's going to be very interesting. Then I'm going to talk about the differences between new world versus old world. And we'll finish by doing a comparative tasting between two blends, one made in Bordeaux, France, and the other one in Argentina, okay? So um, let's start with the recap. So last week, we had, you know, we saw all of these concepts. We saw the concept of climate, okay? So we saw that terroir, this, the, the word in French, it's, um, you know, kind of a connection between soil, topography, the climate, viticulture, and winemaking, okay? So wines with terroir, they kind of represent that place. Um, and then we also, looked at typicality or typicity. So, you know, a wine being typical of its kind. Is this what we expect from a wine from some certain region, right? And we also talked about authenticity, which is, you know, is the wine true to its personality? So not, all, not only, you know, if this is fake or real, but also if it is authentic, if it is true to one's personality. Um, and then we talked about when place transcends the grape. So are you drinking Chablis or are you drinking Chardonnay, right? 
So most people do not know the difference or you know what is common between the two of them. Most people do not know that Chablis is made with Chardonnay simply because in their mind, they say, okay, Chablis is a light body, mineral, high acid, refreshing style of wine. And Chardonnay from most people, it is the Chardonnay from California in a rich oaky buttery style, yes. So last uh, two weeks ago, we had the pleasure of tasting, you know, um, a Chardonnay from Chile and then a Chardonnay from Chablis. And at the end of the session, we were pretty convinced that the Chablis showed its authenticity, its typicity, and even the terroir, if you want to talk about it, okay? So it was a very good uh, tasting and comparison. Right, now, but today we are going to look into other things that, you know, might affect the terroir. So one of this is blending, okay? So let me start by saying that blending, we can blend because of multiple things. So first of all, we can blend by style, right? So let's say that um, my house style, I'm a winemaker and I want my wine to be 90% Cabernet Sauvignon. So I'll try to reach that every year because this is my style. Um, we can also blend by complexity. And think about that. When you're diff, uh, blending different grapes, each grape brings something to the blend, right? So if I blend Grenache with Syrah, which is a very common blend in the Southern Rome, Grenache brings the red fruit. And then Syrah will bring the black fruit and the pepperiness, the spices, okay? So I'm, I'm blending because I want a complex wine. Um, then I blend also for balance, right? So if my wine is going to be too acidic or, you know, too alcoholic, I might blend with another grape that will bring the wine down and it will make it rounder, smoother, more balanced and easier to taste, okay? Um, I also blend because of AOC laws. So that is very common in Europe, but also in Southern France. So to give you an example, you know, some of the appellations in uh, the Languedoc area, for instance, you have to use a percentage of some of the grapes. So if I'm blending carignan with Grenache, with, you know, Syrah and other grapes is because the law tells me to do so, right? I cannot go to France, to Bordeaux and say, oh, I'm gonna put Pinot Noir in my blend. Okay, now you cannot call your wine Bordeaux because, you know, within, within the law, the Appalachian laws, you're only able to use so-and-so grapes, okay? So the law tells me what I can use. Um, of course, we blend because of vintage variation, okay? So, um, and always I tell people that blending is kind of an insurance policy. So think about that. You had a very bad year, right, in Bordeaux. And um, Merlot ripens earlier. And then Cabernet Sauvignon needs a very long time to ripen. So let's say, you know, you harvested the Merlot, everything was going well, and then you had, you know, rain and cold weather and bad weather, and now your fruit is always rot. So this vintage variation, you can even out by having multiple grapes that will give you a blend, okay? Um, you can also blend by price. So, and that is especially important in the new world. So to, to give you guys an example of California, we know that Chardonnay is a, you know, an expensive grape. And then we know that Chenin Blanc, it is not that expensive. So what if I blend a little bit of Chenin Blanc in my Chardonnay, still label it as Chardonnay, but now my price has decreased a little bit so I can reach my target price in the market. So yes, people blend because of pricing too, okay? Um, and you know, you see this written in here, blending in the new world. So in the new world, and you know, I'm, I'm um, 
that is California, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, um, South Africa, Uruguay, blending normally has a 75% rule, okay? So that means if I'm labeling my wine, California Chardonnay, I can put 75% Chardonnay and 25% of any other grape. And I still can put Chardonnay in the bottom. And that is pretty surprising because, you know, of, of course it will affect the taste of the wine, right? So, but the consumer, they buy, okay, this is Chardonnay. They have no idea it is blended. Um, the 85% rule that you see in here, that relates to wines that are made for export markets, such as Europe, because Europe has an 85% rule, or appellations such as Napa, Sonoma, Alexander Valley, you know, Oakville, all of this, you need the 85%, okay? Um, and then, you know, again, vintages in here, but now vintages relating to this percentage of blends. So um, you are allowed to blend other vintages into your current vintage, but you know, you have to respect the 85% rule, okay? So that means, you know, even if you take a look at your bottle and say, I am buying a Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley 2019. Oh, maybe not. Maybe you're, you're, you're buying Cabernet Sauvignon blended with Merlot, Petit Syrah, Ver, Petit Verdot, and so on from 2019 with a little splash of 2018, 2017. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, so blending, it's, it's, you know, a lot of very different things and it can be done to, you know, bring complexity, balance for pricing, for the style of the wine, even out vintages, AOC laws, and so on, okay? All right, so moving forward, um, there is, you know, blending part two. And now here's a question. Can a single varietal wine be a blend, like Pinot Noir? So can Pinot Noir be a blend? So, you know, for Bordeaux blends, Napa Valley, you know, red blends, we all know that this wines can be a blend, but what if I have Sonoma Pinot Noir? Can this be a blend? Yeah, you can chat um, and you can text in the chat box. I'll give you guys uh, a few seconds. Um, yep, right on it, Mark. So Mark is saying yes, definitely yes. Okay, so even though you think you have, you know, one single grape variety in that bottle of wine. Um, yeah, and Cheryl is saying, exactly, multiple vintages, multiple sources, exactly, okay? So you guys are correct. So even when you see Pinot Noir only in a bottle of wine, it can be a blend. And, you know, blending starts in the vineyard. I can blend different, different clones, okay? I can blend from different soils. So if I have um, Chardonnay planted in limestone soils and Chardonnay planted in clay soils, I can blend a little bit to try to, to create a more complex wines. Of course, you know, blends can come from parcels, right? So it doesn't have to, to be single vineyards and also rootstocks, um, okay? And then um, I can have a blend in the winery as well. So, you know, think about different tanks. So if I have a cement tank, if I have a stainless steel, if I have, you know, an amphora, clay amphora, all of this are different tanks that I can use to bring um, more complexity to my wine. Barrels um, is, is a very interesting thing because for instance, in Bordeaux, the winemaker will choose the barrels with at least you know, a year or two years in advance. And they'll say, okay, I'm gonna use these barrels from these five different producers. And then you know, within these barrels, I wanna have a medium toast because I don't want too much aromas in my wine. And then I'll have one barrel that is high toast level so I can have more aromas in my wine, okay? 
And then finally, you can blend, you know, full tanks with full malolactic fermentation and then tanks that do not have any malolactic fermentation. So you can even out and, you know, kind of do partial only and have some aromas of the malolactic, okay? Um, so Mona has a good question. She's asking if we would call it a blend if it is 100% Pinot Noir from several different vineyards, right? Exactly, Mona. You never call it a blend, um, you know, because blending as um, a term refers to multiple grapes, but you know winemakers are doing it because of the complexity, okay? So they still use the same tools to create balance and complexity, ageability to the wine. But now instead of blending different grapes, they will use different parcels, different vineyards, okay? Um, yeah, and Mark says in Oregon, yeah, it is going to be 100% Pinot, definitely. But still you can work with clones, you can work with tanks, barrels, you can work with, you know, different things that will, um, create more complexity, okay? And I'll give you an example of that um, in just one second. So with all of this, you know, I always say that blending is an equation where one plus one equals three because the sum of this, you know, separate parts will be better than the separate parts together, okay? Yeah, so Carr is um, asking the same question. Yeah, so it is, if it is a blended wine, uh, it wouldn't be labeled as a blend. Um, it depends. So in the case of, you know, um, a lot of Napa Cabernet Sauvignons, you only see Napa Cabernet. So even though it has a blend or it has, you know, a percentage of other grapes, um, they do not put it as a blend. And in the case of Bordeaux, you don't even see the grapes, right? You see the appellation. In this case in here is Bordeaux superior. So, so no, unless it is, you know, on purpose and they want to put red blend, um, then you don't see it on the label. In the case of the Altamira, it's really a red blend because you don't have any grape with the majority of it. Um, we'll see it later, but, uh, but yeah. Some people do not like the word blend. So therefore they will put Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and so on, okay? All right, so let me show you a practical example, okay? So example grape here is Chardonnay because we did it two weeks ago, okay? So in France, there are 28 Chardonnay clones available to use. So if I am a winemaker in France, I can choose between this 28 clones to be used uh, in my vineyard. The CIVC, so um, the Champagne Council, lists 11 clones that um, is available to use in Champagne. And for some winemakers, if you do a wine, if you make a wine with one single clone, you're creating uniformity of style and flavors. But if you're doing multi-clone, that is a factor important to quality and complexity. And, you know, and now here is where it gets really uh, geeky. So I'm going to show you three different clones of Chardonnay. So first of all, we have the Mendoza clone. So that was created in UC Davis, okay? But the Mendoza clone um, makes, you know, a Chardonnay with very small berries and tropical character. So mango, pineapple, and the wines made from this clone are bigger, richer, fuller, okay? So people using this Mendoza clone, being in California, in Argentina, in Australia, they want this mango, pineapple, bigger style of Chardonnay, okay? Now, this cloning here, so the I10V1, uh, is well known for giving more white peach, grapefruit, and around the city, okay? 
So let's say you as a winemaker, your style, you do not like the mango pineapple too, too much. So if you plant a little bit of this other clone, you get some more grapefruit and, you know, some rounder acidity. And then <clears throat> on the contrary, clone P58 um, <clears throat> gives a Chardonnay that is very lemony with citrus fruit and a very linear structure, okay? So think about light body, sharp acidity, and all of that, okay? Now, if you're a clever winemaker and you wanna do a very complex Chardonnay, what do you do in the vineyard? You plant all three clones, right? And, and then when you're blending at the winery, you can say, okay, I love the characteristics of the Mendoza clone. However, I need a little bit of the linear structure from clone P58. And then I wanna add, you know, the white peaches or grapefruit of this other clone. And then suddenly you have a wine that is much more balanced and much more complex, right? So instead of having only tropical fruit, now you have tropical fruit, you have stone fruit from peaches, you have green fruit from grapefruit, and then the citrus character. So your wine is much more complex. And you know, it doesn't involve other vintages, other grapes, it doesn't involve, you know, oak or no oak or anything. So we started right in the vineyards. Um, and I think that it, this is fascinating, right? Um, and, you know, some grapes um, see a, a big difference with clones. Um, Pinot Noir is one of them. Chardonnay is another one. And sometimes, you know, and when winemakers wanted to, you know, talk some things about their wines, they talk about clones, but we as consumers or even as wine professionals, we do not understand, okay, what does that mean, right? Why are you talking to me about a Pinot Noir or a Chardonnay clone? And this is what they meant, okay? So what they are trying to say is that my wine is more complex or my wine is better because I use other clones, okay? So, you know, when you add that to the terroir and the notion of topography and climate and soils and everything, it gets um, interesting to say the least, right? Because now the terroir that you smell in a glass of wine, it is not, you know, being brought by one thing only, but it is multiple things combined. Yeah. Can you see that? Have you ever heard about um, different clones and how winemakers use them? Let me see what you think. And again, I'm gonna share the presentation um, with you. So you have all this information and then, you know, in the next um, meeting with your friends. Hopefully you can talk to them about cloning and uh, they will feel excited or not um, about knowing that, okay? Um, yeah, so Janelle says it's truly fascinating and Carr is saying that Willamette Valley is the first place I came across winemakers openly talking about the clones they use. Yes, absolutely, especially because of um, you know, Pinot Noir. So everybody talks about the Dijon clones and, you know, how these clones are great. Um, yeah, and Deborah says she, she heard about it, but did not understand until now. And, um, and Carl goes even further saying uh, he likes 777 in Pinots. Okay, so imagine going to, you know, a winemaker and saying, Okay, yeah, your Pinot is good, but what is your clone? Because, you know, I like 777 and, you know, you did something wrong in here because it is not my favorite wine. Um, yeah, so super interesting stuff and, um, and you know, interesting to see how, how this. And, you know, cloning and clonal material, it is used also because of weather, because of soil. Some clones have, you know, a better structure 
are more hardy or you know resistant than others. So uh, that is one of the main reasons, but also because of flavor. And um, and you know, in the case of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, some clones have really big berries. Some clones have you know just a very tight cluster with um, with small berries. So you truly see the difference. Okay. All right, so so yeah, so you know, I'm bringing another thing for us to talk when we talk about terroir. By the end of this series, is going to be so many things that you know, kind of you say, okay, is this really terroir, or is this really you know a great winemaker taking care, you know, and and uh, a lot of study behind it, right? Okay. Um, so let's move on. Okay, so this is what I wanted to talk about blending. And um, this class, you know, we are tasting two blends. We will return to blending later um, in the sessions when we have blends of other grapes as well. But for now, you know, these are the two examples. Now, <clears throat> let me go then to explain what old world means versus new world, okay? So you see here on the table, so when we talk about old world, and old world is Europe, okay? So everything Europe is old world. New world is, you know, Canada, uh, the US, Mexico, South America, South Africa, um, Australia, New Zealand, okay? So the fruit, in the old world wines is a very fresh fruit, okay? Now, in the new world, this fruit is ripe. The acidity tends to be higher in old world examples of wine. Acidity in new world is only moderate. Albeit, winemakers can acidify wines, okay? Now, the alcohol is also very different because in the old world, normally you have moderate levels of alcohol. In the new world, it tends to be high because you know these very ripe grapes accumulate a lot of sugar. The tannins for the old world being Bordeaux, Rioja, um, Brunello di Montalcino, they are firm, chalky, grainy, okay? So they have a texture to it. Now in the new world, the tannins are ripe, round and smooth, being, you know, a Malbec from Mendoza or a Napa Cab, right? You wouldn't say that a Napa Cab has grainy tannins. The tannins are high, but they are ripe or smooth, okay? And then old world, these wines are age worthy. Um, and in the new world, they also can, you know, be age worthy, but most of the times they are ready to drink now, right? Especially because of this, they are smooth, you know, the fruit is ripe, um, you have a moderate acidity, so that all makes it easier to drink right now. So if I had to choose only one word to describe, you know, what is old world versus new world, old world is savory okay so the wines are savory and new world is plush so it is kind of that you know wine that gives you a hug and you know makes you feel good about it right and in the old world is more savory okay so i keep my space i'm more austere please respect me let me age before you know we we enter in a relationship okay so so all of this um, makes for, you know, wines to be very different. And in fact, um, if you look at, you know, all the blind tastings from Court of Master Sommeliers, the diploma level in WCT, or, you know, the Master of Wine, you always begin with this, you know, is this old world or new world? So, so that is the first thing before you go into countries, regions, subregions, um, so you can, you know, guess what the wine is. Uh, yeah, but we are looking to savory versus plush, okay? Um, of course, uh, climate changing is changing that a little bit. So now we can see the old world or Europe producing wines with very ripe fruits. 
especially you know in warm regions, right? Alcohol levels can be quite high um, as well because of that. Okay. All right. So let me move on, and um, we are going to now talk about you know the, the regions for both of these wines before we taste. And I wanted to give you, you know, kind of a panoramic view about the regions and their terroir, so we can see that later. So Bordeaux, largest population in France, okay, 120,000 hectares. Um, moderate maritime climate. Um, sorry, I spelled climate twice in here. Um, and then, you know, the wines are always a blend. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec. We know Carmen Air was part of Bordeaux blends. And um, Bordeaux has also allowed now different grapes um, because of the climate change. So Bordeaux is a blend, okay? It is not written, you know, which is the main grape. You have to look at the technical sheet or the back label to be able to find Soils in Bordeaux are varied, but you have mainly clay in Pomerol, limestone in saint Emilion, and then gravel and sand um, into the Medoc and Graf area, okay? Rain pattern, that'll be so important when comparing it to Argentina. We have 600 to 800 millimeters of rain, okay? So a lot of cloud covering in this region. And um, if you remember from first class, the Winkler's climate region, right? We were, Chablis was region one, the Chilean um, coast where we were was region one as well. So now we go into region two. That is why I can have red grapes, right? I can ripen that. And what is the style of Bordeaux? Again, it is savory. It is age worthy, okay? Most of the times. Now, um, in here, a map of Bordeaux, okay? And I wanted to show you this map really quickly. You know, I will do another Bordeaux class very soon, uh, but just to show you where um, the vineyards are and where this winery is. So when you have on the label Bordeaux Superior, that means that grapes can come from anywhere in the region, okay? The reason that it is superior or superior is just because you have at least nine months of aging and plus you have you know, a higher alcohol level. Um, but in this specific case of Frank Couplet, uh, he is in the center in here, kind of in Southeast Bordeaux in the green area um, on the, the map. So the winery is in the Entre de Mer. Um, so yes, he has vineyards, you know, close to the two rivers in here, um, as you see. So a lot of sandy soils, maybe with some gravel, maybe with some clay, okay? So here is where um, the winery is. So this is not, you know, Medoc, left bank. It is not Pomerol, San Emilio, right bank. It is right in the middle of it, okay? Um, now, Mendoza, in Argentina, on the other hand, so, you know, Mendoza is west of Buenos Aires. It has a warm continental climate. So the climate in Mendoza is almost like a desert um, because, you know, you have very low rain. Uh, the Andes mountains, they act like a rain shadow. And, um, and you, you see here, you have only 200 to 250 millimeters of rain every year against the 800 of Bordeaux, right? So they have to irrigate to be able to, um, you know, make some good wines. Um, red and white grapes, they have everything from Malbec to Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot. So they have it all in a lot of the white grapes too. And soils in here is most alluvial soils. And alluvial soils are these soils that, you know, they either came because of a river or because of the water coming down from the Andes Mountains. So it brings rocks, it brings, you know, um, 
sand, it brings, you know, a little bit of gravel. And, and so it is a mixture of all of that. Winkler's climate region. So the region here is between two and three, okay? So you see it is a little warmer than Bordeaux, okay? And we have 165 hectares. So it is a big, big region, uh, Mendoza. What is the style? Fruity, ripe, rich, round, full body. So, you know, very easy drinking wines, okay? All right, so, so far so good. Any other questions? Any other comments before we start tasting? All good? Okay, um, yeah. And here you can see the Argentinian um, valleys. So um, you know, to the north, you have Salta, where they have um, the crisp and fresh total test. Um, and then you know, to the center, you have um, Cuyo. So Mendoza is right here. And then to the south, you have the Patagonia area with Rio Negro, Neoquén, where they have more Pinot Noirs. And within Mendoza, um, we have, you know, the Maipu, which kind of was one of the first regions in Mendoza. And, and then Luján, uh, which is a very good region, more altitude, more elevation, as you see and then the Uco Valley. So Uco Valley is the newest region, the highest in altitude. So compare that, you know, 3000 feet against um, the 2300 2, of Maipu. So, and, and that makes for really delicious, special and elegant wines. Um, very high in altitude. And, you know, the Andes Mountains is right here so this is kind of the foothill of the Andes, okay? All right, so um, for the tasting today, um, we will compare these two blends. Um, so first, Chateau Franc Couplet, a Bordeaux Superior, and then the Viedos Altamira, Tres Fincas, um, Valle de Uco, so it's Uco Valley in Mendoza, okay? Um, and let me tell you what are the blends in here. So, Franc Couple, 50% Merlot, okay? Blended with Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Take a look at the alcohol levels. Remember that I said Old World have high, uh, lower alcohol levels? Not in the case of 2018, 2018, 2019, 2020, all warm vintages. So, 14.5% ABV, okay, pretty high, right? Um, now, the Altamira, on the other hand, it is 40% Cabernet Sauvignon, but then it has Malbec, Syrah, Petit Verdot, and Cabernet Franc, okay? So truly a red blend, including Syrah, which is permitted in Mendoza, not permitted in Bordeaux. Um, alcohol levels, 14.6, so the same. So the same alcohol level as the Bordeaux, okay? So fermentation in inert vessels and, you know, both age uh, in oak barrels, um, the Tres Fincas for 14 months, the Franc Couple around 12 to 14 months as well. So very similar winemaking. There is one thing that is different, um, the Tres Fincas has a cool fermentation. And I'll explain about this as we taste, okay? So um, finally, um, we are ready to taste. So if you haven't, pour wine number one, the Franc Couple Bordeaux Superior, and then wine number two, the Altamira Reserve. So we can compare and contrast these two wines, okay? And I will stop sharing for a minute um, so we can do the tasting together and then I'll go back to the presentation. So let me stop sharing here. All right. Um, okay, so very good. So first of all, you know, um, both wines are really, really dark, but I do get a little bit more purple 
from uh, the Argentinian wine. That might be because of the Syrah. Syrah is a very purple type of grape. Malbec as well. Okay, so Malbec is, is said to give kind of a pink electric rim. So where, you know, the Bordeaux is, is your deep um, ruby color. Okay, so you see the differences um, about that. So let's analyze um, the wines on the nose. And if you want to participate, please do. Um, I'll read your comments. And, you know, let me know what you think about this Bordeaux. If the fruit is, uh, you know, jammy or if it is ripe or if it is fresh. And then what else can you find? Smells so good. Oh gosh, okay. Okay. Oh, so different, okay. The Altamira is so, so different on the nose. Interesting, okay. And uh, both wines have, you know, kind of the same price. Um, I think they are both under $20. I'll confirm the price um, for you. But, you know, I wanted to taste the same quality so we can have a few, you know, if terroir matters in this case, okay? All right, so wine number one, uh, Chateau Franc Couple, 2018. Yeah, so Karen is saying that um, the Bordeaux is very typical on the nose, and I agree. It is, um, you know, the oak in here, the spices, um, yeah, Mona says she's tasting the Bordeaux only today, so she's smelling eucalyptus, and I agree. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. And then there is a black fruit in here, you know, but more like black currants. So think about cassis. So the fruit is, is quite ripe, right? But it's not overripe. It is not a confected fruit. It is, you know, just a ripe fruit. And I do get um, some savory notes. So um, Mona is sharing on the chat, wet leaves, forest floor, earth, which I completely agree. And those are the savory notes that you get from the Bordeaux. And for me, there is something else which is kind of the stony minerality, okay? So the gravel, kind of, I can smell in here the crushed gravels, okay? So I'm not saying that it's coming from this soil or anything. I'm just saying that I can smell crushed gravels in this wine. So remember that for the Chablis, we had you know, the smell of oysters. So in this case, for me, the smell is uh, crushed gravels, okay? So yes, it is savory, right? You have fruits, it is there, but you have oak, you have you know, the tobacco, you have um, the wet leaves. Yeah. And I think that's what I mean, Mona, um, for the, the mineral. Okay, so without tasting, or if you have, good for you, you know, let's smell the Argentinian blend to see how similar or different this wine is. And in my opinion, it's completely different. Okay. So um, let me know your comments, but for me, the focus um, of this wine is fruit. The fruit in here is pure, it's pretty, it's beautiful. So the focus is on fruit. So I can smell, you know, from blue fruits, um, so blueberries to black fruits. So think about black plum, black cherry. And then there is so, some red fruit as well, okay? Like red plum, red currants. So yeah, and Cheryl is saying she smells bacon, which is uh, the smell of Syrah. So Syrah smells like bacon, which is, you know, delicious. Um, so that is the smell of Syrah. So, you know, see how a good blend works? 
So I smell first, you know, blue fruits, black fruits, red fruits. Cheryl gets the bacon and that is because of the Syrah. So now you're adding a little bit of all the grapes in here so you can create more complexity, right? So first from, you know, the darker purple color, um, we know that the grapes are contributing to it, okay? So, so yeah, but I, you know, focus of this wine is on fruit, whereas the first wine, it is more savory, it is more oak. And remember, this wine has oak too, right? But until now, I haven't talked about the oak because the fruit is so ripe and it is so evident and exuberant in this wine. All right, so go ahead and taste wine number one, uh, the Bordeaux Superior. Yeah, and if it is your first wine of the day, you need, you know, two sips at the least. Okay, um, so what I can say about this wine is that the finish is very, very, very dry, okay? So the savory notes are much more intense on the palate. So all the, you know, earth and um, mineral and, you know, mushrooms and tobacco, it is really the focus of this wine. So you have some fruit, but the fruit is way in the background. Uh, the wine is so savory and so, so dry. It finishes dry. Tannins in this wine. So even though it is a Bordeaux Superior and Bordeaux Superiors, these wines are meant to be drunk as young. Okay, these are ready to drink wines. You shouldn't get a Bordeaux Superior and age for 30 years. Um, but even with that, the tannins are kind of, you know, grainy or they are there. You can feel the tannins, right? It is not something, you know, so easy to drink. Um, so I think, you know, this wine, it shows what a good entry level Bordeaux wine is. The savory character, um, the very dry palate, kind of the austere thing that, you know, wants you to have something with it, right? You need a food. You need a piece of cheese, some charcuterie, you know, a piece of steak or something. So, so you can pair with it. Okay, very, very savory. Um, yeah, so for Mona, the alcohol is a little hot. And um, yeah, she says it's not so well integrated. Um, and I can see that Mona, 14.5% is, you know, really, if you don't have a ton of fruit or a ton of structure, kind of will seem a little bit unbalanced. Um, it is not bothering me, but you know, maybe with food um, will be a little better, okay? Now, um, go ahead and taste the Altamira Tres Fincas um, immediately after. So we can take a look what's the differences and similarities between these two wines, okay? And meanwhile, I am um, confirming the prices in here and let me put on the chat. So Chateau Franc Complete, 1899. And then Tres Fincas. Tres Fincas is $19.99 or $19.97. So exactly the same price, okay? Okay, so wine number two. Let's do the Altamira Tres Fincas and see how on the palate the wine is similar or different. Okay, so interesting. So the, um, the Altamira, it's 
you know, the focus is on fruit and you feel that on the palate as well. So a lot of the blue fruits notes, um, the blackberry notes, the focus is definitely on fruit. It is, you know, the body is higher. So whereas in Franc Couple, kind of we had a medium body type of wine. In this case, you know, we have a full body type of wine, even if the, 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 the alcohol is the same. And um, of course, it's a dry wine, okay? So there's no residual sugar in this wine, but the finish is kind of of the sweet fruit. Um, so, you know, it makes for, for an easier to drink style. And, um, and the tannins, you know, here is the, you know, they are there, but they are ripe. They are really plushy tannins. So it makes um, easier to drink as well. Um, yeah, so Carl has a very good comment. He says that the Argentinian, um, it's less hot in the alcohol be because the fruit is so much brighter. The fruit is so much more evident. And I agree. It is, you know, if you have alcohol to balance, you have to have some structure, right? To be able to balance it out. Uh, in the case of the Argentinian, you have a lot of fruit. So therefore, you don't feel the alcohol too, too much. Whereas in Bordeaux, it is a more austere style with very savory notes. So kind of the alcohol level, you know, it is kind of disjointed from the wine. Okay. So um, Mona says that she thinks the, the Bordeaux is a good value. Very nice tertiary notes for a young wine at an accessible price. Exactly. And I agree. So, so the reason that I chose this wine, you know, and that I, I have it at the wine shop is, okay, if people are looking to buy a Bordeaux at $18, you know, knowing that we are paying higher price these days, that the wines are, you know, much more pricier these days, this is a good entry level that is typical. Right. So now I was looking for typicity for this wine and it is a by the book Bordeaux. It is savory. It is, you know, you have this gravel notes, you have, you know, the black currant notes. So it is, um, it is really a Bordeaux by the book. Okay. So it is what I wanted in here. Um, all right, so let me know if you have any other comments. I wanna go back to the presentation and you know, just um, share um, a little bit more information in here. So let me go back um, to the old world versus new world. So yes, we saw that um, the fruit is fresher in the Bordeaux, much riper in the Argentinian one. The acidity, you know, both are fresh, both are good. Um, the alcohol is high in both. 2018, again, was a hot vintage in Bordeaux, okay? But yes, we have this savory profile and the tannins are more grainy. Whereas in the Argentinian one, it is, you know, very ripe fruits and very smooth, easy to drink with riper tannins, okay? So both wines are exactly the description of old world and new world in here, okay? Now, I wanted to go back to the technical sheets in here so I can, you know, finally explain something about the cool fermentation that when I look at the technical sheet, I said, oh, okay, I know what you're doing. Um, so, in Bordeaux, normally they will use stainless steel tanks, you know, cement vessels, and they can also use oak fats, right? Um, fermentation in Bordeaux is temperature controlled nowadays as well, you know, can be, but it's never too low. And 18 to 22 Celsius, we consider to be a very low cool temperature fermentation. In Bordeaux, it's more, you know, kind of warm uh, fermentation. So. The reason that you do a cool fermentation versus a warm fermentation is that in a warm fermentation, you're looking to extract tannins. Um, in a cool fermentation, you want it to extract the brighter fruit notes and some floral aromas as well. You're not too worried about the tannins 
you know, you're more worried about the fruit. And, and I think, you know, again, this wine hit the mark because um, for the Bordeaux, you know, the tannins are more apparent, they are there. And then for the Tres Fincas, you have, you know, the school fermentation brought all these beautiful fruity flavors. We didn't say any flowers, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I can smell some violets in here as well. So, so you know, again, um, kind of showing what they are, okay? Um, this is not 2019 here. I'm going to remove from the presentation. Um, yeah, 2019 was another great vintage in in um, Mendoza, so you don't have to worry about this in here was a typo, okay? So um, with that, you know, so now what is that makes this wines different or similar? Is this the terroir? You know, both are Winkler's region two, both have a mixture of soils, right? So now it is different than the Chablis that we said, okay, no, definitely was the soil you know, the, the, the very mineral um, kind of oyster shells type of soils give, give, you know, the typicity for the wine. So now what is it that brings the typicity for this wine? Is it the climate? It is the blend of grapes? It's the style that they're trying to make? Or is it a combination of everything? And, um, you know, so, oh, sorry, let me go back in here. And as everything, I think, um, is a combination of factors, right? Nothing in the wine industry is, you know, 100% one answer. You have a combination of factors. Um, but you really have to think here to see that Mendoza has much more sun. Europe has a lot more cloud covering, okay? So that makes a difference in into how bright the fruit is and how the fruit presents. And then you have different winemaking styles, right? So for Tres Fincas, they wanted to do this, you know, fruit focused styles, whereas in Bordeaux, they wanted to, to give this more complex savoriness to the wine. So, um, so they will use all the resources available to them, okay? So does that make sense? Do you have any questions, any other comments about these two wines? Uh, did, you, did you like you know, one over the other one? I'm not sure if you are all tasting. What I have been doing is you know, taste the wine via Corvin. So basically I remove just a little bit of the wine. Can you see? I remove a little bit. Uh, you know, the wine is still under cork. So I have a Corvin at home and I use it. Um, my husband said that, you know, for the next series of webinars, we have to send you guys either the Corvin capsules or, um, you know, the closures so you can close the wine. Um, but yeah, but I have both and I, I'm using, uh, like this. So, you know, you can finish the bottle later when you have family around, um, and something. Um, so Good question in here from Carl. So what do we know about the differences in harvesting? Do new world growings tend to harvest um, later than old world? That is true. Um, and you know, was true for multiple years. So because they were waiting for that fruit to be very, very ripe, right? And they had the sun and the beautiful conditions. Whereas in the old world and in Bordeaux in particular, you know, you're playing with fire. Because if you wait too much, you might get into October and then, you know, rain comes and, you know, bad weather and you can have rot. So kind of, you know, how much should I wait um, so I can harvest the grapes? And, um, and, you know, nowadays, even in Bordeaux, everybody is looking to have very ripe fruit, but they have to, you know, consider the alcohol levels and also they have to consider, you know, these extreme weather conditions. So you don't want to risk everything harvest in late October to have, you know, great ripeness and then harvest nothing. So, so kind of, you know, October is, is, um, is fall. So, so you have this condition. So you want to, um, 
harvest earlier. Whereas in Argentina, you can wait, right? There is not a cloud coming, you know? So it's, uh, it's a lot re less rain and a lot less cloud covering. So, so that is why vintage variation is not as important as it is still in the old world. Um, and yes, harvest conditions. Nowadays, everybody, you know, go to, to kind of the same schools. Everybody does uh, harvests and, and vintages in different countries around the world. But it is just, you know, should I wait and maybe, you know, bad weather will get me or should I, I harvest now? So that is, I think, one of the main differences, okay? Okay, um, so, so yeah, let me know, you know, what you guys think about the wines, uh, if you liked one better than the other one. I think, you know, these wines should be consumed in different moments, right? The Argentinian one, you can easily sip by itself while you're waiting for the dinner or something. It is, um, it is so great. And the Bordeaux, yeah, has more complexity. Um, and so, you know, you can, can actually have it with food um, and so on. So Julian is saying that he's a newbie and uh, he liked the Bordeaux smell, but the taste of the Argentinian better. And I can see that. And I think you're totally right, right? Because for the Bordeaux, you have this very complex aromas and flavors. So you smell it and said, oh, this is interesting. So, you know, smell one, you find the fruit and then, you know, smell again, you find the oak and smell again. So, you know, you smell the wine 10 times and 10 times you find a different aroma and flavor. You know, I just found plum in here from the Merlot, uh, but it is very dry and austere on the palate. The Argentinian, on the other hand, it is kind of, you know, fruit on the nose and that's it. But when you taste is so plushy and so bright, um, so, you know, it tastes better. So, yeah, um, some people used to say, you know, if you are in a restaurant and you want to, you know, pay a very cheap price for the wine, if you have to choose between old world and new world, probably the wine from the new world would be better in the sense that is ready, riper, fruitier. Um, the old world probably will need, you know, decanting or aging or, you know, some, some heavier dishes. So just to keep that in mind. Um, but I think, at, you know, at the same price point, these wines do represent, um, you know, their terroir, their, their typical styles um, so, so well. Okay. All right, um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of what I had for today um, for this, you know, series. Um, I wanted to talk about blends, how blending affects quality, affects style. And also I, I wanted to talk about the difference between old world versus new world. And I think, um, you know, the examples were to the point in here. Um, so, so yeah, and, um, and then, you know, if you have any other comments, questions, let me know. Otherwise I will see you in two weeks and, um, two weeks from now we will have, we are back into the whites again. So, um, what is the whites? Are we going Riesling? I think it is Riesling or Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but yeah, it is going to be fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, happy Wine Wednesday. Hope you can enjoy the wines with family, friends, alone this weekend. And uh, if you have any other comments and questions, let me know. You can always write to my email or to the info at floridawineacademy.com. And yes. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Karen Shells. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, a pleasure to have you all. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, yeah, thanks, Janelle. Thank you, Mona. And I'll see you guys then in two weeks. All right. Bye, guys. Enjoy the wines.